All right. Uh, years ago, I, I uh, met an Idaho potato farmer, and I believe he was from Pocatator, Idaho, and he told me that there were three kinds of potatoes. Um, I looked puzzled, but of course my 20-something mind told me, well, okay, it was my stomach. Mashed potatoes, fries, baked potatoes, of course, yes. Made me hungry. He looked at me and said, the three kind of taters are agitator, spectator, and participator. I looked puzzled, so he went on to explain. Okay, agitators complain and rile people up. Complain, complain, complain. If there weren't no luck, I'd have, if there weren't bad luck, I'd have no luck at all. Spectators watch other people live their lives, but they really don't have any life of their own. They attend concerts, go to games, watch TV. They love reality shows. The couch potato is a cousin of, to the spectator, always watching television, college football on Saturday, NFL on Sunday, binge watching all 14 seasons of Grey's Anatomy on Netflix. The participator is an action tater, always doing things, living life, serving others. There are many ways that you can participate in life. There are community leagues that you can participate in. Soccer, football, basketball, bowling, ultimate frisbee, softball, cricket, rugby, hockey, tennis, golf, ping pong. Well, maybe not NASCAR. You should probably continue to watch NASCAR. Now, it's much better to participate in a sport rather than just to watch it. Yes, you might get stuck in right field, but you will be a better person for it. What position do you play? If you're not into team sports, then just get out into the great outdoors. Walk, run, hack, bicycle, or make smoothies. As much as I enjoy attending Columbus Symphony Orchestra concerts, it's way better to play in one. This happens to be a band. Yes, that's me, the tuba in the back row. Uh, my wife's in the front row, and this is something that we can do together. Uh, sing in a community choir. Um, that's all I got on this card, so we'll have 15, no, 10 seconds of silence, okay? Participate in community theater, whether acting, building sets, being a stagehand, or making costumes. Participate in your own food in some way. Have a garden. Eat if you live in an apartment. You can grow tomato plant on your balcony. Pick peaches or apples at the local orchard. Shop at your farmer's market. For the more adventurous, you can raise chickens to collect the eggs. Of course, the question remains, which came first, the chicken or the eggs? Volunteer. There are many charitable organizations that need your help. They also need your money, but you can find one that you can be passionate about and volunteer your time and effort. Don't just complain about a bug. Create a pull request. Enough said. <laughs> and finally, while it's great to come and listen to all these wonderful talks, it's even better to participate. Volunteer at your local DevOps days. Be on the organizing committee. Suggest an open space topic, or maybe even speak. So, son, the question is, what kind of tater are you? Thank you.
All right, I'm kind of going to cheat here because I have to read my notes because I'm not that bright. Oh, look what I did. No. There we go. I think it's still going. Hi, everybody. I'm PJ. And as soon as this slide changed, how many people know what Elk Stack is? Cool, you can ignore most of this. Um, so Elk Stack is a really cool thing that uh, Elastic came up with. Uh, it's El Elasticsearch, Logstash, and Kibana. It's awesome. They had this brilliant idea to use all these open source tools so that people could do really neat things. Uh, it started with Elasticsearch, which you might have heard of. Originally built to be kind of a search attachment to applications. Uh, later moved to you know, be able to search data so that we can build this cool thing called the Elk Stack. Not everything when you make it turns out the way that you wanted it. Logstash, kind of the pain of the Elk Stack, not gonna lie. Um, that's all about data manipulation, input, output, making sure things are stacked the way you want to see them. And it really makes the whole monitor thing come together so that you can get a really nice dashboard, which is what Kibana is for. Kibana is the pretty part. Kibana is what makes it you able to go to your CTO and say, look, everything's blowing up. Don't we need new servers now? I have data. So it's really neat the way they put it together. So I'm going to kind of go through how you actually get this stuff going. The first thing you need is the extra ingredient, which is the cloud. You can run Elk on bare metal. It's not recommended. You kind of want like a high availability system because you want to monitor your infrastructure and make sure it's working properly. So pick a good cloud provider. AWS does that kind of thing. Um, I just I named this slide hard to port because Ports are heavily involved, so make sure you're setting up the correct permissions, and I'll talk about that in, in the next few slides. Also, I wanted a picture of a boat, so boat. <laughs> so getting started, the first thing you need has nothing to do with the Elk stack. You just have to make sure that you have Java installed. It needs to be Java 8. Don't automatically assume that your cloud provider has Java 8 running on your infrastructure. They might not. Make sure you update. Do default-jre to make sure it's there. Then we need to install Elasticsearch. Um, this is key, it's pretty easy. You set it up, look for the latest package. If you want to go that, you can also specify which number you want, and then sudo apt-get install. Really easy, pretty straightforward, except for this little catch. You have to adjust the elastic shirt search YAML. You have to ensure that you actually have it looking at network, I believe the f it's network.host and it's 0.0.0.0, and that will work on pretty much all of the cloud providers you see. Logstash is a little more straightforward. You pr pretty much have to get it, transport it, install it. Make sure it's up to date. Make sure that your versions are all running on the same numbers. That's key. Logstash doesn't require a configuration adjustment like the other two. It just kind of runs. Uh, Kibana, very similar to Elast uh, the Elasticsearch piece. Uh, you get the version. You get it. Make sure it's updated. You install it. Um, you will have to make a configuration adjustment just like in the other one. Similar, it's not network.host, but it's another network setting to make sure that it's looking in the right place. After you adjust those YAML files for both Elasticsearch and Kibana, you will need to restart the services. Logstash, you never have to restart the service. It just kind of runs. It's just kind of there. Um, so this will get you almost all the way there. But you might want to look at other things. So Elastic has this thing called Beats. Beats are pretty cool. You can specify the kind of thing you're looking at. If you're just looking at like file downloads, you can have file beats. If you're looking at metrics, they have metric beats. They have many different kind of beats. Um, this is not associated with Dr. Dre. Once you get it set up, you'll see this screen. And you'll, you'll think at first, like you're like, yes, I'm there. And then you get this, and you're like, that's not a cool dashboard, because you actually have to tell Elk what you want to look at. This is where you kind of use the beats, or you put a log stash configuration in there and say, this is what I want to do. Then you get your sweet dashboard. And this is just the beginning. Like, this is a very simple dashboard that, that was put together. It's kind of a default. Um, it's not giving me a lot of information, but I can get much more specific as I drill down and look at things. And you can measure anything from, you know, IP address ranges to, you know, specific CPU usage, depending on what you want. There are a few gotchas. Like I said, make sure you're using Java 8. Uh, mind your versioning. You want to make sure that Logstash, Elk, Elasticsearch, and Kibana are all using the same thing, and make sure those ports are open and make sure they're secure. Maintenance. This is a gotcha all by itself. It's great to do this, and it made it seem really simple to install because I only have five minutes, but maintenance is the hard part. Keeping up to date with Elastic when they're pushing out you know, new patches and new versions all the time is a little bit difficult. So luckily, there's an alternative. There are services out there. I happen to represent one called Logs.io, where we do all of that maintenance and installation for you. You just point your stuff at us, and then you make the pretty dashboards. We do all the rest for you. So that's pretty cool. Um, what else? That's it. Thank you so much. All right, I'll wait for it to roll over. Come up over here. 
Okay, I have five things for you. I have pithy diagrams, pithy definitions, uh, one 80s cartoon reference, a solid misunderstanding of how Ignite talks work because I have 15 slides at 20 seconds instead of 20 slides at 15 seconds, and so I'm gonna talk even faster than I normally do, I am sorry. I wanna talk to you about instrumentation. This is a thing that I think most of us probably understand, at least on some intuitive level, right? Like, oh crap, something's broken, can you please go instrument that service because we don't know what's going on because computers are terrible and they don't, know, and they don't work and we don't know what they're doing. So go in and you know instrument it so that we can see what it's actually doing. This is fine as long as we're in a situation where we have a problem that we all understand collectively and we can look at it and we say, hey, we know what we're doing, but it's difficult when we have to step back and say, well, how am I gonna instrument in general so that I know what my machines are doing in general so that I can observe them, so that I have observability of my system. So my friend, Peter Borgon, wrote this blog post like back in February. It's a great blog post, it's in the lower left corner there, but it's not showing up because I don't know reasons. And uh, he said there are essentially three different types of instrumentation that we do. We have metrics, logging, and tracing. So metrics, uh, their defining feature is that they are, this is an old version of the talk. <laughs> I'll figure it out, super fun, okay. Uh, they combine together, yeah. Um, uh, uh, that's the reason that they're a Venn diagram because we have the three different kinds and they overlap. So you can see, you can imagine that we have metrics, which aggregate nicely, logging, which are like these big discrete events, maybe they're structured, maybe they're not, and then tracing, which is actually following the path of a request through your infrastructure. And you can combine these together. Uh, aggregatable events would be something like, oh, we have, you know, whoops, um, and I'm on to the next slide. Uh, <laughs> uh, this is a sort of undocumented, unfully figured out area. I talked to a lot of different companies about this, but what we know so far is that these are three roughly good breakdowns, but we actually can't combine them very well uh, in terms of understanding, and we're on to the next one. Hello, my name, hey, my name is uh, Don Evan. I am a platform developer and uh, wannabe DevOps guy at Plex. Uh, the guy on the left is actually my dad, not me. He's up there because this summer I realized everything I learned about DevOps, I learned from my dad. That actually is me. I grew the beard so you could tell the difference. Uh, growing up, I wanted to be just like my dad. He's a pilot and commercial aircraft mechanic. Uh, but there's some interesting parallels between DevOps and aviation. So uh, for SaaS products, we strive for nines of uptime, but uh, it's hard to apply the same aggregation to aviation. Uh, in terms of just getting you from point A to point B safely though, the numbers are kind of similar. Um, lots of similar problems, similar solutions. So whether it's keeping a server up or a plane up, humans make mistakes, pilot error, so to speak. Um, but what's interesting is that both DevOps and aviation attempt to mitigate these factors sometimes in similar ways. So one of those ways is checklists. So checklists are a great way to, oh, nope, lost it, maybe. Yeah, there we go. Checklists are a great way to mitigate missteps in high stress situations. Best of all, they provide for objective decision making. So in aviation, there's this concept of a minimum equipment list. Uh, so the idea is during pre-flight, you're looking at equipment and if something is missing or inoperative, you can consult the equipment list, a uh, minimum equipment list, and it'll tell you whether yes or no you can fly or yes you can fly, but not in X weather. It gives you objective decision making. Uh, it's one thing to have checklists, another thing to use them. Maybe you've inherited a product or project and it came with checklists and you're not using them. Fortunately with DevOps tools, we can kind of like programmatically enforce some of our checklists through workflow and such. Um, but accidents still happen, right? So uh, up there, that's the uh, NTSB reporter. It's a publication that pilots can subscribe to that has uh, summaries of recent accident investigations. And the idea being pilots, they can learn from each other, learn from each other's mistakes. Um, we don't really have an equivalent publication, I think, in DevOps, but there's some great GitHub repos of public postmortems. Uh, and two, internally, you should be taking your postmortems, you know, your private ones, have them a place internally where devs can learn from them. Uh, kind of in keeping with that learning from each other, stepping outside of your comfort zone. Uh, so pilots often after they get their pilot's license will go do aerobatic training, not because they intend to become aerobatic pilots, but because it allows them to uh, train maneuvers that they wouldn't normally get to do. Um, so postmortems, checklists, those all seem like obvious things. Some less obvious lessons from aviation um, are that airplanes are not cars, uh, contrary to the picture. Uh, that is an airplane that is also a car, but airplanes are not cars. Uh, Cars have come a long way. You used to have to know what was going on underneath the hood to operate a motor vehicle, you know, whether that's a stick shift or a cold start. You know, I don't even think I have a check engine light. I think I get like my diagnostics from email, like OnStar or something like that. Uh, cars are very push button now. Airplanes, not so much. Whether you're a lawyer or a doctor and you're studying to become a pilot uh, or get your pilot's license, you still have to understand aerodynamic principles. Same thing goes for engines. Uh, engines pilots are not expected to become experts on, but they have to know how the conditions 
uh, affect the engine, such as carburetor icing. Uh, the idea being, though, that we want the products that we build for our customers to be like cars. We want them to be very push button. But the products that we build for each other, for other developers or system administrators, should be built such that you still have a respect for what's going on under the hood. So as kind of an example of this, uh, a couple months ago, I tried to teach myself Prometheus and Grafana and uh, found some great example documentation, quickly you know, pasted it together, Docker up, whatever, and had some very sexy looking graphs early on, right, all done, deploy it to prod, use this to monitor. Um, but I quickly realized though that uh, something was wrong. All, all my graphs for CPU were showing twice what I had expected them to be. Uh, so I had to actually dig deep, stop cut and pasting, read books on Pro uh, Prometheus. Um, the moral of the story is to know your instruments. So. Uh, pilots, uh, the, the instrum instruments used in aviation oftentimes work uh, on gyroscopes or air pressure as the, the fundamental principle on which they operate. Pilots, when they're studying, uh, they learn not just what the instruments are and what they mean, but they have to also understand those principles on which they operate so they can understand when their instruments are potentially erroneous or may drift. Same thing goes for instrumenting your production systems. So in closing, um, when when dealing with incident management, we kind of call it firefighting, or we may call the people's, people in incident management superheroes, uh, or may promote like a superhero culture. Uh, in aviation, there are totally heroes as well. We just hear about them a lot less because there are a lot less you know, big outages, so to speak. Uh, so I just think if we look at aviation and other product domains, we can potentially bring more reliability to our own products. Good job. Hey, I'm Chris Short. I was up here last year. Uh, it was my first talk ever, and uh, I ended up moving here. So beware where you do your first DevOps Days talk. You might end up in Detroit. Ah, sorry. Uh, so I work at Bank right now. Thanks to my boss for letting me come and do this. He's here in the audience, so hopefully I do a good job. Um, otherwise, he'll fire me or something terrible, I'm sure. Um, next slide, maybe now. Yeah, here we go. So I'm going to talk about continuous learning and books and other things. So obviously Gene Kim is pretty awesome. So is John Willis. They're here. Uh, let's bump into them, say hi. Uh, the Phoenix Project is a great book. If you're new to DevOps, read it. It will inspire you. Uh, big takeaway is we all know a Brent, don't be him. The DevOps Handbook is the follow-on book to the Phoenix Project. It is what the Phoenix Project was missing, I think, as far as like technical details. And uh, if you're reading this book and quoting it, you kind of know you're doing DevOps at that point. Uh, the 12-factor app, if you haven't read this, it's kind of like how to do software these days. It's amazing how many developers I run into that haven't read it. No offense, developers, but come on. Um, <laughs> it's like five years old, so give it the program. Release it. Uh, it's a great book, um, but it's really hard to find right now because it's in between editions, so it's kind of funny that its name's Release It. <laughs> <laughs> so it has to be out like around Christmas time. Um, yeah, sorry. Continuous Delivery, a uh, great book uh, by Jez Humble and uh, David Farley. The uh, big thing is obviously DevOps. When people talk about shift left, they're talking about concepts from this book. So read that, good stuff. Uh, site Reliability Engineering. If you haven't read it, it's free. Go to the website, get it. But it's like proof positive that if you just throw a bunch of money at engineering problems, light it on fire, it will fix itself. Um, you're not Google, so like you're not going to have their size problems, but you can get some good stuff from it. The Art of Monitoring by James Turnbull, great book. Uh, <laughs> speaking of art, if art is measured by number of pages, this one wins. It's 767 pages of how to do monitoring. It's pretty good, but it's very, very detailed. Uh, Effective DevOps, written by two people that I think used to work at Etsy because they just fired a bunch of people, which is kind of crappy, but you know, uh, they mentioned that as a good example in the book. Just don't do the firing part. That's kind of bad. Uh, Enterprise DevOps Playbook. I actually uh, just heard of this and starting to skim through it. Um, Enterprise and DevOps can work. So like people at GM and Ford, like DevOps works. Believe it. Um, somehow. This book will tell you, hopefully. So <laughs> the Open Organization Guide to IT Culture Change. I actually contributed to this book. Uh, it's pretty great. It's kind of like the SRE style essays. Um, it's easy to read, lots of different opinions from lots of different people. Check it out, it's free online. You can buy a copy for like five bucks. Uh, Lean Enterprise, if you haven't read this, it'll teach you, it's not, a way, it's, not a, it's not a diet book. It's not gonna teach you anything about weight loss, but it'll teach you how to run your uh, company better, your organization better, whether you're manager of a team or 
CTO kind of deal. Beyond Blame, uh, this one was recommended by someone I met at DevOps Days Raleigh a few weeks ago. Uh, I blame this book for your blame problems because you haven't read it yet. It teaches you how to learn from failure and actually not blame people. Uh, how Complex Systems Failed, one of our speakers this morning, like Dr. Cook, he wrote all this stuff. It's five pages. It is awesome. Go read it. It's super simple. You can read it in the break period. Uh, but basically, you're human, so you're the problem. Um, sorry. You're born. Um, <laughs> in search of certainty is kind of slightly terrifying, but uh, the only things that are certain are pretty much death taxes and pager duty, or Octogeny, sorry, they're a sponsor. Um, <laughs> but <laughs> sorry. The, uh, the upside of stress, I uh, actually just heard of this one. Uh, the author, Kelly McGonagall, I can't say her name, has a TED Talk. Highly suggest you like go watch it, but it basically flips your mind around on stress, like it's actually good for you, which means, thankfully for me, I'll live forever. Um, the End of Heaven is kind of like an earth-shattering look at uh, disaster in modern times. Uh, it was recommended to me by John Willis. Uh, makes you rethink your feelings on like life and slightly controversial. Uh, not really DevOps, but uh, if you're in business, chances are you are working with people that have read this book, so it mentions Know Thy Enemy. Well, you might want to read the book at some point, too. Uh, it's kind of a tough read, though. There's tons of different translations. So, uh, end with a quote from Andrew Clay Schaefer. You're either building a learning organization or you will be losing to someone who is. So make sure you are continuously learning yourself and in your organization. Thanks. <laughs>